This sound file contains the spoken version of the Wikipedia article on the Battle of the Denmark Strait. The material was recorded on December 17th, 2017. The Battle of the Denmark Strait from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia at en.wikipedia.org. The Battle of the Denmark Strait was a naval engagement on May 24th, 1941 in the Second World War between ships of the Royal Navy and the German Kriegsmarine. The British battleship HMS Prince of Wales and the battle cruiser HMS Hood fought the German battleship Bismarck and the heavy cruiser Prince Eugen, which were attempting to break out into the North Atlantic to attack Allied merchant shipping. Fewer than 10 minutes after the British opened fire, a shell from Bismarck struck Hood near her aft ammunition magazines. Soon afterwards, Hood exploded and sank within three minutes with the loss of all but three of her crew. Prince of Wales continued to exchange fire with Bismarck, but suffered serious malfunctions in her main armament. The British battleship had only just been completed in late March 1941, and used new quadruple gun turrets that were unreliable. Therefore, the Prince of Wales soon broke off the engagement. The battle was considered a tactical victory for the Germans, but its impact was short-lived. The damage done to Bismarck's forward fuel tanks forced the abandonment of the breakout and an attempt to escape the dry dock facilities in occupied France, producing an operational victory for the British. Incensed by the loss of Hood, a large British force pursued and sank Bismarck three days later. Section 1. Background The two German ships were expected to sail westward and break through the Greenland-Iceland-UK gap. While passing neutral Sweden in the Baltic Sea, the ships were spotted and reported by the Swedish cruiser Gotland and patrol planes. These reports were intercepted by the British Embassy, allowing Royal Navy ships to watch their probable route. Due to cloud and rain, aircraft scheduled to assist in the search could not do so when the German ships attempted their breakout. On the evening of May 23rd, despite the advantage of inclement weather to cloak the Germans' presence, the two ships were spotted steaming at 27 knots by the British heavy cruisers HMS Norfolk and Suffolk. These cruisers, each carrying eight 8-inch eight guns, were patrolling the Denmark Strait under the command of Rear Admiral Frederick Wake Walker. With the help of Suffolk's newly installed radar, the cruisers shadowed the German ships, reporting on their movements throughout the night. The next morning, at the exit to the strait between Iceland and Greenland, a force of eight British ships was in place to intercept the Germans. The British fleet included the battleship Prince of Wales, the battlecruiser HMS Hood, and a screen of six destroyers under the command of Vice Admiral Lancelot Holland in Hood. Prince of Wales was a newly commissioned King George V class battleship, similar to Bismarck in size and power. Prince of Wales had not yet properly, quote, shaken down, unquote, and her crew was inexperienced. She still had mechanical problems, especially with her main armament. The ship had sailed with shipyard workers still aboard working on her. For 20 years after her commissioning in 1920, Hood was the largest and heaviest warship in the world, combining eight massive BL 15-inch Mark I naval guns with a top speed greater than any battleship on the sea. Hood was the pride of Great Britain's navy and embodied the world dominance of British naval power. Despite this, Hood had one conspicuous flaw as compared to the super dreadnought battleships she served alongside. As a battlecruiser, much of her bulk was dedicated to extra engine power instead of comprehensive armor coverage. This was in accordance with the prevailing theory originally propounded by First Sea Lord Jackie Fisher that, quote, speed is armor, unquote. While her 12-inch belt armor was considered sufficient against most capital ships she was likely to encounter, her 3 inches of deck armor was only raided against shell splinters, leaving her badly unprotected against plunging fire at long range. At the same time of her commissioning in World War I, naval gunnery was severely inaccurate at the ranges necessary to produce plunging fire, and Hood's greater speed and maneuverability were rightly seen as an acceptable trade-off. However, as the accuracy of naval gunfire increased in the interwar period, Hood was eventually scheduled to receive an upgrade in 1939 that would have doubled her deck armor to 6 inches but the outbreak of World War II meant the upgrade never took place. She thus soared to war at a marked disadvantage against the new capital ships of the Axis. Aware of Hood's inadequate protective armor, distant to the southeast of where the battle took place, Vice Admiral Holland's superior, Admiral Sir John Tovey, deliberated on ordering Vice Admiral Holland 
to have Prince of Wales sail ahead of Hood. With the ships in this position, Admiral Tovey concluded that the better protected Prince of Wales could draw the German battleship's large shell gunfire. Ultimately, Admiral Tovey did not give the order, later saying, quote, I do not feel such interference with such a senior officer justified, unquote. Section 2, Prelude. Plan Gone Ari. Vice Admiral Holland's battle plan was to have Hood and Prince of Wales engage Bismarck while Suffolk and Norfolk engaged Prince Eugen. He signaled this to Captain John C. Leach of Prince of Wales, but did not radio Rear Admiral Wake Walker, who as commander of the 1st Cruiser Squadron directed Suffolk and Norfolk for fear of disclosing his location. Instead, he observed radio silence. Holland hoped to meet the enemy at approximately 2 o'clock in the morning. Sunset in this latitude was at 1.51. Ship's clocks were four hours ahead of local time. Bismarck and Prince Eugen would be silhouetted against the sun's afterglow, while Hood and Prince Wales could approach rapidly, unseen in the darkness, to a range close enough not to endanger Hood with plunging fire from Bismarck. The Germans would not expect an attack from this quarter, giving the British the advantage of surprise. The planned success depended on Suffolk's continually unbroken contact with the German ships. However, Suffolk lost contact from 0028. For 90 minutes, Holland neither sighted the German ships nor received any further news from Norfolk or Suffolk. Reluctantly, Holland ordered Hood and Prince of Wales to turn south-southwest, but he detached his destroyers, which continued searching to the north. Before contact was re-established, the two squadrons missed each other narrowly. Had the German ships not altered course to the west at 141 to follow the line of the Greenland ice pack, the British would have intercepted them much earlier than they did. The British destroyers were just 10 miles to the southeast when the Germans made this course change. If the visibility had not been reduced to 3 to 5 miles, the German vessels would have probably been spotted, since generally on a calm, clear day, ship lookouts can observe large objects in ships about 12 miles distant on the horizon. And if the ship lookouts are on a crow's nest, the observable distance is even further. Just before 3 o'clock, Suffolk regained contact with Bismarck, Hood, and Prince of Wales were 35 miles away, slightly ahead of the Germans. Holland signaled to steer toward the Germans and increased speed to 28 knots. Suffolk's loss of contact had placed the British at a disadvantage. Instead of the swiftly closing head-on approach Holland had envisioned, he would have to converge at a wider angle, much more slowly. This would leave Hood vulnerable to Bismarck's plunging shells for a much longer period. The situation worsened further when, at 3.20, Suffolk reported that the Germans had made a further course alteration to the west placing the German and British squadrons almost a beam of each other. At 5.35, lookouts on Prince of Wales spotted the German ships 17 miles away. The Germans, already alerted to the British presence through their hydrophonic equipment, picked up the smoke and masts of the British ships 10 minutes later. At this point, Holland had the option of joining Suffolk and shadowing Bismarck and waiting for Tovey to arrive with King George V and other ships to attack or to order his squadron into action. He chose the latter at 537. The rough seas in the strait kept the destroyer's roll to a minimum, and the cruisers Norfolk and Suffolk would be too far behind the German force to reach the battle. Section 3. Battle. Opening Moves. Hood opened fire at 552 at a distance of approximately 26,500 yards. Holland had ordered firing to commence on the leading ship Prince Eugen, believing from her position that she was Bismarck. Holland soon amended his order and directed both ships to engage the rear ship, Bismarck. Prince of Wales had already identified and engaged Bismarck, whereas Hood is believed to have continued to fire at Prince Eugen for some time. Holland was a gunnery expert. He was well aware of the danger posed by Hood's weak horizontal protection and wanted to reduce the range as quickly as possible. At a shorter range, the trajectory of Bismarck's shells would be flatter and they would be more likely to hit the sides of the ship rather than the deck or to glance off the top deck. Holland closed the range at an angle that placed the German ships too far forward of the beam, which meant that only 10 of the 18 British heavy guns could train and presented the Germans with a bigger target than necessary. One of Prince of Wales's forward guns became unserviceable after the first salvo, leaving only nine still firing. Suffolk and Norfolk tried to engage Bismarck during the action, but both were out of range and an insufficient speed advantage over Bismarck rapidly to close the range. The Germans also had the weather gauge, meaning that the British ships were steaming into the wind, spray drenching the lenses of Prince of Wales' A turret's 42-foot 
Boren Stroud Coincidence Rangefinder and both British ships B turret 30 foot rangefinders. The shorter based 15 foot ones in the director towers had to be used instead. Holland had Prince of Wales stay close to Hood, conforming to Hood's movements instead of varying course and speed, which made it easier for the Germans to find the range to both British ships. It would have aided Holland's gunners if they had both fired upon Bismarck as originally planned, since they could time precisely each other's salvos to avoid mistaking one ship's fire for the other. The British could also use concentration fire, where both ships' main armament salvos would be controlled by one ship's fire control computer, probably Prince of Wales' modern Admiralty fire control table. Prince of Wales struck her target first. She would ultimately hit Bismarck three times. One shell struck the commander's boat and put the seaplane catapult amidships out of action. The second shell passed through the bow from one side to the other without exploding. The third struck the hole underwater and burst inside the ship, flooding a generator room and damaging the bulkhead to an adjoining boiler room, partially flooding it. The last two hits caused damage to Bismarck's machinery and medium flooding. The hit also severed a steam line and wounded five of Bismarck's crew by scalding. The damage to the bow cut access to 1,000 long tons of fuel oil in the forward fuel tanks, caused Bismarck to leave an oil slick, and reduced her speed by two knots. Bismarck was soon listing nine degrees to port and lost two meters of freeboard at her bow. The Germans held their fire until 555 when both German ships fired on Hood. Admiral Lutjens, the German fleet chief and task force commander, did not immediately give the order to commence firing. Not until he had multiple inquiries did Bismarck's first governor officer, Corvetten Capitan Adalbert Schneider, ask permission to open fire. The commander of Bismarck, Capitan Zursi Ernst Leindmann, impatiently responded, I'm not letting my ship get shot out from under my arse. Open fire. A shell hit Hood's boat deck, starting a sizable fire in the ready-use 4-inch ammunition store, but this fire did not spread to the other areas of the ship or cause the later explosion. It is possible that Hood was struck again at the base of her bridge and in her foretop radar director. There has been contention over which German vessel struck Hood. Prince Eugen was firing Prince of Wales following an order from the fleet commander. The gunnery officer of Prince Eugen, Paul Schmalenbach, is quoted as saying that Prince Eugen's target was Hood. Sinking of Hood At 6 o'clock, Holland ordered his force to turn once again to port to ensure that the aft main guns on both Hood and Prince of Wales could bear on the German ships. During the turn, a salvo from Bismarck fired from about 9 miles was seen by men aboard Prince of Wales to straddle Hood abreast her main mast. It is likely that one 38 centimeter shell struck somewhere between Hood's main mast and X turret aft of the mast. A huge pillar of flame that shot upward, quote, like a giant blowtorch, unquote, in the vicinity of the main mast, followed by an explosion that destroyed a large portion of the ship from amidships clear to the rear of Y turret, blowing both after turrets into the sea. The ship broke in two and the stern fell away and sank. Ted Briggs, one of the survivors, claimed Hood heeled to 30 degrees, at which point, quote, we knew she just wasn't coming back, unquote. The bow rose clear of the water, pointed upward, pivoted about, and sank shortly after the stern. A turret fired a salvo while in this upright position, possibly from the doomed gun crew, just before the bow section sank. Splinters rained down on Prince of Wales, half a mile away. Hood sank in about three minutes, with 1,415 members of the crew. Only Ted Briggs, Bob Tilburn, and Bill Dundas survived to be rescued two hours later by the destroyer HMS Electra. The Admiralty later concluded that the most likely explanation for the loss of Hood was a penetration of her magazines by a 38 centimeter shell from Bismarck causing the explosion. Recent research with submersible craft suggests that the initial explosion was in the aft 4-inch magazine and that it spread to the 15-inch magazines via the ammunition trunks. It has been suggested from examination of the wreckage found in 2001 that the magazine explosion in the 4-inch armament near the mainmast caused the vertical blast of flame seen there, and this in turn ignited the magazines of the aft 15-inch guns that caused the explosion that wrecked the stern. This explosion might have traveled through the starboard fuel tanks, igniting the fuel oil there, setting off the forward magazines, and completing the destruction of the ship. The wreck of Hood revealed the bow section bereft of any structure. A huge section of her side is missing, from the A barbette to the foredeck. The midship section had its plates curled outward. 
Moreover, the main parts of the forward structure, including the 600 long tons conning tower, were found about 1.1 kilometers away from the main wreckage. This has sparked theories that the 15-inch forward magazines exploded as a result of the force, flames, and pressure caused by the detonation of the aft magazines. However, a team of marine forensic scientists has found that implosion damage to the forward hull due to the rapid sinking of the hood is the most likely cause of the state of the forward hull, and they do not support any theory that the forward magazines exploded. Prince of Wales alone. Prince of Wales found herself steering towards the sinking hood. Her commanding officer, Captain Leach, ordered an emergency avoidance turnaway from Hood's wreckage. This violent change of course disrupted her aim and put her in a position that made it easier for the Germans to target her. She resumed her previous course, but was now under the concentrated fire of both German ships. Prince of Wales was struck four times by Bismarck and three times by Prince Eugen. One shell passed through her upper superstructure, killing or wounding several crewmen in the compass platform and air defense platform. Pieces of another shell struck her radar office aft, killing the crewmen within. A 20.3 centimeter shell from Prince Eugen found its way to the propelling charge slash round manipulation chamber below the aft 5.25 inch gun curds, and a 38 centimeter shell from Bismarck hit underwater below the armor belt, penetrating about 13 feet into the ship's hull, about 25 feet below the waterline, but was stopped by the anti-torpedo bulkhead. Fortunately for Prince of Wales, neither shell exploded, but she still suffered minor flooding and the loss of some fuel oil. Contrary to some mistaken opinion, the 38 centimeter shell that struck Prince of Wales below the waterline did not endanger her magazines as it came to rest abreast an auxiliary machinery room. By this time, serious gunnery malfunctions had caused intermittent problems with the main armament, leading to a 26% reduction in output. According to Captain Leach, he decided that continuing the action would risk losing Prince of Wales without inflicting further damage on the enemy. He therefore ordered the ship to make smoke and withdraw, pending a more favorable opportunity. Prince of Wales turned away just after 6.04, firing from her rear turret under local control until the turret suffered a jammed shell ring, cutting off the ammunition supply and making the guns inoperable. Despite efforts by crew members and civilian technicians to repair the shell ring, all four guns were not back in service until 8.25, although two of the four guns were serviceable by 720. This temporarily left only five 14-inch guns operational, but nine of the ten were operational in five hours. The final salvos fired were ragged and are believed to have fallen short. The ship retired from the battle around 6.10. Thirteen of her crew had been killed, nine were wounded. The timing of Prince of Wales's withdrawal was fortunate for her as she had come into torpedo range of Prince Eugen and turned away as the German cruiser was about to fire. Breaking off the action. On Bismarck, there was tremendous elation at the sinking of Hood. There was also a keen expectation that they would close on Prince of Wales and possibly finish her off. Bismarck's captain, Ernst Lindman, requested that Admiral Luchens allow Bismarck to do just that. Even if British Admiral John Toby's squadron had left Scapa Flow the previous day, he would still be more than 300 nautical miles away from Bismarck, even if Bismarck diverted to sink Prince of Wales. Luchens refused to allow Lindman to give chase, giving no explanation. Lindman repeated his request, this time more assertively. Luchens held firm orders from the German naval commander, Gross Admiral Eric Rader, to avoid unnecessary combat with the Royal Navy, especially when it could lead to further damage that could hasten delivering Bismarck toward the waiting hands of the British. He broke off combat instead of pursuing Prince of Wales and ordered a course of 270 degrees due west. Bismarck had fired 93 of her 353 base-fused armored-piercing shells during the engagement. This clash between the two senior German officers reflected their disparate and distinct command functions. As commander of Bismarck, Lindemann operated first and foremost as a tactician. As such, he had no doubt that his ship's immediate objective was to destroy Prince of Wales, and he had pressed his case as far and as hard as he could. Luchens, as fleet chief and task force commander, operated at the strategic and operational levels. To some degree, his orders were clear. Attacking convoys was his priority, not risking, quote, a major engagement for limited and perhaps uncertain goals, unquote. Nevertheless, Raider had also ordered Luchens to be bold and imaginative, to accept battle if unavoidable, 
and conduct it vigorously to the finish. The reality was that Luchin's orders did not cover a spectacular success like the one just achieved. His priority, therefore, was to stick to his instructions, to concentrate on sinking merchant shipping and avoid encounters with enemy warships whenever possible. Moreover, before leaving Germany, Luchens had told Admirals Konrad Patzik and Wilhelm Marshall that he would adhere to Raider's directives. This meant that he did not intend to become the third fleet chief to be relieved for contradicting Raider's orders. Marshall, one of his two predecessors, had been relieved of command for not following his orders to the letter, despite the fact that Marshall's analysis of the changes in the tactical situation since the orders were issued resulted in the sinking of the British aircraft carrier HMS Glorious and its two escorting destroyers. Nor was he predisposed to discuss his command decisions with a subordinate officer. Even if he had known it was the untried Prince of Wales he was fighting, and not King George V, Luchens would have probably stuck to his decision. Following her would have meant exposing the squadron to further gunfire, as well as to torpedo attacks from Norfolk and Suffolk. He would have risked his ships and crews on an expressly forbidden opportunity. Between 619 and 625, Suffolk fired six salvos in the direction of Bismarck, having mistaken a radar contact with an aircraft for Bismarck. Suffolk was actually out of gun range of both Bismarck and Prince Eugen at the time. Section 4. Aftermath Vice Admiral Holland's death led to responsibility for Prince of Wales falling to Rear Admiral Wake Walker in Norfolk. With his command came the responsibility of coping with Bismarck until enough British warships could concentrate and destroy her. His choice was either to renew the action with the Bismarck or ensure that she be intercepted and brought to action by other heavy units. Wake Walker chose the latter course, continuing to shadow the German ships. Further offensive action, he concluded, would cause more damage to Prince of Wales than to Bismarck and endanger his cruisers. Plus, he knew Admiral Toby was on his way. He ordered Prince of Wales to follow Norfolk at her best speed so that Norfolk and Suffolk could fall back on her if attacked. At 7.57, Suffolk reported that Bismarck had reduced speed and appeared damaged. Since Bismarck's receiving the first hit in the forecastle, all six of the ship's 26-man damage control teams had worked ceaselessly to repair the damage. When it was reported that the tips of the starboard propeller could be seen above water, Lindemann had ordered counter-flooding two compartments aft to restore the ship's trim. He then sent divers into the forecastle to connect the forward fuel tanks, containing a much-needed 1,000 long tons of fuel, first to the tanks near the forward boiler, then to the rear fuel tank by way of a provisional line running over the upper deck. Both these maneuvers failed. Lindman then requested permission to slow Bismarck and heal the ship first to one side, then the other to weld patches from the inside to the holes in the forward hull. Luchens refused, again without comment. Eventually, the Admiral had to agree to slow the ship to 22 knots to allow hammocks and collision matting to be stuffed in the holes of the number 2 boiler room and the auxiliary boiler room to stop the growing ingress of seawater. This attempt also failed. Boiler room number 2 was shut down, with a loss of speed to 28 knots. As well as taking on seawater, Bismarck was leaking fuel oil. Luchens ordered Prince Eugen to drop back and see how much of a trail she was leaving astern. The carpet of oil was broad enough to cover both sides of the ship's wake, was all colors of the rainbow, and gave off a strong smell, all of which helped disclose Bismarck's location. The damage to Bismarck's forward fuel tanks, combined with a missed opportunity to refuel at Bergen earlier in the voyage, left less than 3,000 long tons of fuel remaining, not enough to operate effectively against the Atlantic convoys. The element of surprise, which was considered essential for the operation's success, had most definitely been lost. The German ships continued to be shadowed by Rear Admiral Wake Walker's squadron. Luchens concluded that he needed to abort Bismarck's mission and head toward a convenient dockyard for repairs. The question was which dockyard to head for. The nearest friendly ports were Bergen and Trondheim in Norway, a little over 1,000 miles away. Steaming in that direction meant a return passage north or south of Iceland, with the enemy's air forces now fully alerted to their presence and the possibility of other heavy units between them and Scapa Flow. Luchens knew his intelligence was unreliable. Hood had been reported by Group North to be off West Africa, and there had been no reports of a King George V-class battleship in the vicinity. Disregarding Lindman's recommendation to return to Bergen, Luchens ordered Bismarck to head for the French port of Saint-Nazaire. Although the French coast was 600 miles further away than Bergen, Saint-Nazaire held the potential of longer nights and wider seas, 
in which to shake off Bismarck's shadowers, plus the possibility of luring them across a line of U-boats. It would leave Bismarck poised on the edge of the British trade routes once the damage were repaired. It also meant the potential support of the battleships Scharnhorst and Nissenau. Both ships had been stationed at Brest in France since the end of Operation Berlin earlier that year, but had been kept in port for repairs and overhaul. While Brest was closer than saint Nazaire, it was within range of Royal Air Force bombers. Luchens detached the undamaged Prince Eugen to continue raiding on her own. The cruiser went further south into the Atlantic, where she refueled from a tanker at sea. She suffered engine trouble, abandoned her commerce raiding mission without having sunk any merchant ships, and made it to Brest. Section 5. Reaction. German. News of Luchen's decision was received with shock in Berlin, Wilhelmshaven, and Paris. A blizzard of urgent telephone calls raced across German-occupied Europe. While the Berlin Admiralty was satisfied with Luchen's success, it was tempered by news of Bismarck's damage and the decision to head for France. Grand Admiral Rader was not clear whether Luchen's intended to steam for Saint Nazaire immediately or after shaking off his pursuers and oiling in mid-Atlantic. Radar immediately conferred with his chief of staff, Admiral Otto Schneewind, who in turn telephoned Admiral Rolf Karls, who commanded Group North in Wilhelmshaven. Karls had already drafted a message recalling Luchens to Germany, but had not yet sent it. Schneewind pointed out at noon, Luchens had crossed the demarcation line between the northern Hebrides and southern Greenland, thus passing from Group North's operational control to Group West. Therefore, the decision to recall Luchens was no longer Karls to make. A subsequent call to Group West's commander, Admiral Alfred Salwachter, revealed that he did not plan to recall Luchens, and that he felt such a decision should be discussed between Schneewind and Raider. Raider was against issuing a recall himself, telling Schneewind they did not know enough about the situation at hand, and that the person who would best know would be Luchens. He then telephoned Adolf Hitler, who was at Obersalzburg in the Bavarian Alps. Hitler received the news of Hood sinking stoically, exhibiting neither joy nor any other triumphant behavior. After hearing Raider's report, he turned to those who were with him and expressed his personal thoughts. Quote, if now these British cruisers are maintaining contact, and Luchens has sunk the Hood and nearly crippled the other, which was brand new and having trouble with her guns during the action, why didn't he sink her too? Why hasn't he tried to get out of there, or why hasn't he turned around? Unquote. News of Hood's destruction was seized upon more enthusiastically by Dr. Joseph Goebbels' propaganda ministry. That evening it was broadcast to the nation, accompanied by, quote, We March Against England, unquote, and other martial airs. The German public, already enjoying the news of Luftwaffe victories over the Royal Navy off Crete, received the news of Hood sinking euphorically. British. The British public were shocked at their most emblematic warship, and more than 1,400 of her crew had been destroyed so suddenly. The Admiralty mobilized every available warship in the Atlantic to hunt down and destroy Bismarck. The Royal Navy forces pursued and brought Bismarck to battle. The German battleship was sunk on the morning of May 27th. Moves were subsequently made to Court Martial Wake Walker and Captain John Leach of Prince of Wales. The view was taken that they were wrong not to have continued the battle with Bismarck after Hood had been sunk. John Toby, Commander-in-Chief of the Home Fleet, was appalled at this criticism. A row ensued between Tovey and his superior, Admiral Sir Dudley Pound. Tovey stated that the two officers had acted correctly, ensuring that the German ships were tracked and not endangering their ships needlessly. Furthermore, Prince of Wales's main guns had repeatedly malfunctioned, and she could not have matched Bismarck. Tovey threatened to resign his position and appear at any court-martial as defendant's friend and defense witness. No more was heard of the proposal. A British board of inquiry quickly investigated the cause of Hood's explosion and produced a report. After criticism that the initial inquiry did not record all the available evidence, a second board of inquiry more extensively investigated Hood's loss and examined the vulnerabilities of other large British warships still in service in light of the probable causes of the explosion. It, like the first inquiry, concluded that a 15-inch shell from Bismarck caused the explosion of Hood's aft ammunition magazines. This led to refitting some older British warships with increased protection for their ammunition magazines and some other related improvements. Many naval historians and writers have analyzed the Bismarck engagement and weighed the participants' decisions. One of the most debated is Admiral Luchin's decision 
to proceed into the Atlantic rather than continue the battle. Section 6. Parallels to Jutland A number of parallels could be drawn from Vice Admiral Holland's actions in this battle and those of Admiral David Beatty in the opening stages of the Battle of Jutland. From his actions, it seems clear that Holland felt he had to engage Bismarck immediately rather than support Wake Walker in shadowing until Force H could arrive. Beatty likewise felt he needed to engage German Admiral Franz Hipper's battlecruisers with his own forces instead of drawing the Germans toward Admiral John Jellicoe and the British Grand Fleet. Holland, like Beatty, possessed superiority in the number of heavy ships he possessed, yet he was encumbered by inferiority in fighting effectiveness of those units. Moreover, Holland's deployment of his units compared to Beatty's deployment at Jutland. Beatty and Holland both attacked while German units were well before the beam. As a result, the midships and after turrets of Beatty's ships could barely fire on the enemy. Holland's ships could not use their after turrets until the final turn to port, just before Hood was sunk. Beatty placed his light armored battlecruisers at the head of his line, leaving the more powerful and better armored Queen Elizabeths in the rear. Likewise, Holland placed the old and vulnerable Hood ahead of the better armored, albeit new and untested, Prince of Wales. Both admirals exercised tight tactical control over their units from their flagships. This prevented Captain Leach from maneuvering Prince of Wales independently and possibly taking a different line of approach that might have confused the Germans. Section 7. Order of Battle Note: The British escorting destroyers were ordered to the battle coordinates as part of the overall forces sent to intercept the German ships they were detached the evening before the battle. Axis. German battleship Bismarck. German heavy cruiser Prince Eugen. Allied. The British battleship Prince of Wales. The British battlecruiser HMS Hood. The British heavy cruisers HMS Suffolk and HMS Norfolk. The British destroyers HMS Aketes, Antelope, Anthony, Echo, Electra, and Icarus. This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 3.0 unported license available at http colon forward slash forward slash creativecommons.org forward slash licenses forward slash by dash sa forward slash 3.0.